Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, now we stand forgiven at the cross. to see his pain written on his face bearing the awesome weight of our sin every bitter thought Every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross. Christ became in for us he took the blame he bore the wrath now we stand forgiven at the cross Yes, now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head, curtain torn in two, dead or raised to life finished the victory cry yes this the power of the cross Christ became sin for us he took the blame he bore the wrath now we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see our name written in the wounds for through your suffering we are free death is crushed to death life is ours to live one through your selfless love 
this the power of the cross son of god slain for us oh what a love what a cost now we stand forgiven at the cross oh what a love what a cost that we stand forgiven at the cross Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day sing that with me please at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Aren't you? Amen. I am blessed to be a part of a good family here. Thank the Lord for my heritage, my earthly heritage. But I am more thankful for being a part of the family of God. Amen. What a blessing it is to know Jesus. All right, if you have your Bible today, and I hope you do, turn with us to the book of Jonah, if you will. I promise I have not forgotten about that whole armor of God in Ephesians, and we will get back to that. Jonah, chapter number one, we'll continue there this morning. The main theme of Jonah, chapter one, has to do with the command of God being evaded. And there are certainly consequences for that. So I'm just going to pray this morning, not going to do a lot of review. Uh, with the Lord's help, I would like to make it to through chapter 1 this morning, and there are several verses to go. And with the help of the Lord, I have several things I would like to say about those verses that remain. And so it's, I may not finish with Jonah chapter 1 this morning, or we may have a lengthy sermon, but it will be one or the other. That's for sure. And so let's pray together, ask the Lord to help us and speak to our hearts today. A lot of folks don't know anything about the book of Jonah other than a great fish or a great whale. 
If that's all you know about the book of Jonah, you don't know much about it. There's 48 verses. Only three of those verses mention anything about the whale or the great fish, I should say. It has a lot to do with going away from the presence of the Lord, choosing to do your own thing, choosing to do your own way, and the consequences that are ensued because of that. So I want to be obedient to the Lord. I want to be obedient to God's Word. And I pray the Lord would help us to preach this morning in such a way that it will be a help to you and a blessing to you. I, I don't plan to, to preach in, in uh, anger or to be ill or anything like that at all. And I don't know how I'll preach, but if I preach hard and I preach and you may take it in such a way as being harsh, that is certainly not my intent. I want to help you. I want to help your family. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 4 that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so the Word of God sometimes cuts. And if the Word of God cuts your heart today, it's not me. It's God's Word that's cutting your heart. If the Lord speaks to your heart today, it has nothing to do with me being the pastor or me being the preacher. It has everything to do with God's Word being right and correct. Amen. And it's important that we take heed to God's Word regardless of who the individual is that is delivering God's Word. I'm getting just a tad bit ahead of myself, but I will say this. There were two great revivals in the book of Jonah the revival seemed to follow him, and it had nothing to do with Jonah. And so the man, it can, man can never bring revival. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the one who is standing before you. It's all about what we do or how we respond to what thus saith the Lord. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. There's a big debate about whether or not, and, and I'll get to, to the text in a minute. If, if I don't, that'll be all right too. There's a big debate about whether or not we'll ever have revival again in America. And I'm not a prophet. I have no idea whether we will or not. I do know that the Bible says that wicked men and evil seducers shall wax worse and worse. So I know that to be true, but I know that God does not change. And I believe that any time any individual, any group of people will seek God, God will help them and God will move and intervene in their behalf. So whether or not we have a revival in America, whether or not we ever have another worldwide revival, whether we have revival in our church or not, you can have revival in your heart today if you choose to have one. And the reason that we don't see a widespread revival in the days that we live is because there are so many of God's people who could care less about what God thinks or what God has to say. And there's very few church people and even saved people that care more about what God says than what CNN says. They're more interested in what their sports team did this week than what God has to say. They're more concerned with where they're going to go next week and what they have planned and their entertainment and their, uh, all of these side things and all these hobbies and all that that they don't come to church on Sunday morning just to say that they've done something or to check a box that I did something that's pleasing to God. That's pathetic. You can have revival if you want it. You know, you know you, you're as close to God right now as you want to be. You, you, can blame, you can blame everybody else for all your trouble, your apathy, your coldness, your indifference. You can, you can say it's the preacher's fault, it's the church's fault, it's so-and-so's fault, it's my family's fault. No, every single one of us, myself included, is as close to God as we want to be. The Lord said, if you would draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. God hasn't changed. If you're drawing nigh to God, he is going to draw nigh to you. And that, that is truth. If you're not drawing nigh to God, he's not drawing nigh to you. And so you've separated yourself from God. What does that have to do with this? Well, I don't know. Maybe a lot. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible. Did you help us? Would you help us as individuals? Would you help us collectively? Would you help us, Lord, not to just know intellectually that the Bible is true? Would you help us to put it to work and to test in our heart and actually prove out in our lives the truth of God's Word? 
Would you help us, Lord, today as we look into these verses and we're given a great uh, lesson of instruction concerning what God expects and how God responds Would you help us, Lord, to choose a different path than Jonah chose? But Lord, if we have chosen the path that Jonah has chosen, would you help us, Lord, to repent and turn to God and seek help? He's a merciful God. You're a gracious God, and you're willing, Lord, to restore. We see that in the book as well, and that's a great truth. Lord, would you help me to preach today? Would you use me, Lord, to be a help and a blessing to this group of people? Would you rescue us from apathy? Would you rescue us from disobedience? Would you rescue us from self-righteousness? Would you rescue us from selfishness, being so full of ourselves that we can't be full of God? Sure need your help, Lord. We ask you to help us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read the verses. I want to get down to verse number 12 where I want to begin preaching. And so I'll just mention some things in passing. The first three verses have to do with God's commands to Jonah. And the Bible says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before them. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so in these first three verses, it is obvious that Jonah at one time was in the presence of the Lord. So the only way that you can go from the presence of the Lord is that you had at one time been in the presence of the Lord. And so he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And uh, God had commanded him to go to Nineveh and to cry against their wickedness. But instead of going to Nineveh, instead of obeying God's word and doing as he is instructed, he has fled from the presence of the Lord. So here's a lesson. You cannot be disobedient to what the Lord commands and remain in His presence. You can't be dis. I'm, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. There's a lot of people saved who haven't had any fellowship with God in a long time. There's a lot of people who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and you can't even remember the last time that you and God had intimate fellowship one with another. Disobedience and the presence of the Lord do not go hand in hand. Look at verse number four. Verse number four starts with the word but. Now, what we see in verses eight through 11, four through seven is that there's a mighty tempest, there's a great storm. And so, verse number four says, But you can go away from God, but you're going to be butting heads with Him. And you can flee from His presence, you can be disobedient to Him. But there are consequences. You can do as you choose. You, you, you're free to do that. God's not going to put a rope around you and drag you into his wheel. He, he's not going to put blinders on you and say, this is, the, this is your only path. This is the only way. You know, we're not robots. You can choose. Jonah made a choice. But... But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him, and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Verse 4, I've already mentioned this several, several times, it begins with the word but. So you can choose to be disobedient to the Lord's command. You can choose to do your own thing. You can choose to do your own way. But you cannot choose how the Lord will respond to your disobedience. 
Jonah had no choice in how God would respond to his choice. You have a choice. You have no, you have no way to choose how God is going to respond to your disobedience. Jonah has left the presence of the Lord only to find himself in what we can safely say is the storm of his life. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're dealing with. But I would make sure that I am not in that storm because I have chose to flee from the presence of the Lord. I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm glad you're here. I wish there were a lot more people here. I'm not talking about you being faithful to a few things that the church is involved in. I'm talking about your personal daily hourly relationship and fellowship with God. Do you have a life that's pleasing to the Lord? In verses 8 through 11, we see the cause. We, we, we don't have to wonder why Jonah is in the storm. We don't, we don't have to wonder how come uh, all of this is upon these mariners who, uh, as far as we can tell, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let me ask you something before I read these verses. Who in your life is in the wrong place at the wrong time and they didn't do anything to put themselves there? No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself and all of our choices have consequences. Jonah chose to go away from the presence of the Lord and in doing so, he's buttoned heads with God and God put him in the storm of his life and in the storm of his life are some men who did nothing to be there. We see the cause of this evil. The Bible says in verse number 8, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence cometh thou? What is thy country? And what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Well, I, 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 I don't want to be too harsh to you here, Jonah, but if you feared the Lord, it's not likely that you would have fled from his presence. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the man knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be common to us? For the sea rolled and was tempestuous." What we see in these verses is that when you choose to flee from the presence of the Lord, when you choose to, as Jonah did, take a boat ride to hell, I like the way Brother Carlson put that, you, you decide that your way of doing things is better than the way the Lord said to do things. And you're not only putting your life in danger, you're putting the lives of everyone in your boat in danger. And I don't care how good a boat it is. I don't care how strong a ship it is. I don't care how strong you think your relationships are. I don't care how wonderful you think your household is. I don't, think, I, I don't care how glamorous or all of those things may seem in your mind. When you go against God, your boat is not strong enough to hold up. It's not going to be polished enough. It's not going to be pretty enough. The, the materials are not going to be sufficient. The, the bow is not going to be strong enough. The, the bow is not going to survive the storm. And your life and your relationships will not survive either if you choose to flee from the presence of the Lord. You think about it this way for just a moment. If you flee from the presence of God, you're headed in the opposite direction of what he has commanded. You've bought your own ticket. You've paid for your own destruction. And you're dragging those who are nearest you in the same condemnation. And you need to stop looking around for someone to blame and look in the mirror as Jonah did and say, it's my fault that we're in this condemnation. I'll give Jonah credit for one thing. He was man enough to own up to his disobedience. 
That's a good question. Are you man enough? Are you woman enough to own up to your own disobedience? Now, verses 12 through 16, Jonah is cast into the sea. And I don't apologize, but I've done been preaching 15 or so minutes, and I just now got to where I want to get to. In verse number 12, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Jonah, speaking to the mariners, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great temptest is upon you. So for just a moment, let's remember that there are multiple lessons that we can learn from the same scripture in the Bible. And we can get a couple from this one. First of all, in typology, what a, what a great thing we see here. We see the principle of substitution in this chapter. Jonah is going to have to die in order for the mariners to live. This is a beautiful picture of, of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ taking my place and taking your place. And he was willing to die. Now, in Jonah's case, obviously he's guilty, but the Lord Jesus Christ was innocent. He, ha he had no sin. There was no guile in his mouth. And the innocent died for you and I who was the guilty. So we see the principle or the typology, the principle of substitution. Jonah is going to have to die. And if Jonah doesn't die, if Jonah doesn't doesn't go into the sea, then everyone in this boat is going to die because of Jonah's sin, and Jonah willingly took their place. Well, he didn't willingly take their place. We'll find that out in a minute. But we do see the principle of substitution. One must die in order for them to live. Second, secondly, that's type in top, uh, topology first. Secondly, historically, or in its context, I made mention earlier, I know there's a lot of racism here, and normally that's what we hear concerning Jonah and his, his uh, unwillingness to preach to the Ninevites. And I, I certainly can see that, and I understand that, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing that thought or going against that, but it's deeper than that. Jonah knows that Israel is in, in, in sin and they're away from God. And Jonah knows that if he goes to Nineveh and he preaches that God is faithful, and if Nineveh will repent, that God will uh, grant them repentance, and then God will use them to, as a nation to go against Israel. And so Jonah here, he is a, he is a true patriot of Israel. And uh, he is more interested in them than his own country not being punished than he is someone else being saved. I want to ask you something. What is more important to you than somebody else being saved? Is your patriotism more important to you than someone else knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior? I hope not. And so historically or in the context, Jonah's intention is to save Israel from the Ninevites by dying himself. In other words, he, he has this idea, if I die then I'm not going to have to go to Nineveh and preach. And if I don't go to Nineveh and preach, they won't repent. And if they won't repent, God won't use them to chastise Israel. And so I'd rather die. How, how far away from God do you have to get before that's your mentality? I'd rather die than repent. It's really quiet in here this morning. It seems that Jonah had rather die than to preach to Nineveh. And uh, he, he understands that God will use them to destroy Israel if they get right with God. Now, thirdly, here's the third thing. Let's think about this from this verse as well. I am amazed at how much pain and torment men will suffer instead of repenting. There have, there have been men and women who have ruined their entire life rather than end an adulterous relationship. There are men and women who have, they've, they've destroyed, destroyed their, their homes, they've, they've, they've lost, lost their spouse, spouse they've, they've lost, lost their children, children, they've lost their home, and they've lost all of their earthly possessions because of their dependence upon drugs and alcohol. They'd rather have that than to repent of that, that they might save those things that are way more precious. Now listen, God smoked my, I was laying in my bed this morning 
meditating upon these verses of Scripture, and God gave me all of these thoughts that I'm giving to you right now about 3 o'clock this morning, and we always, we, we as believers, we as Christians, we, we can't understand how, why people would destroy their lives and, and ruin their testimonies and ruin their homes because of drugs and alcohol, and yet God's people will sit in the pew in their pious religious self, and they'll let bitterness and anger and division ruin their homes ruin their marriages, ruin their testimonies, ruin their church, destroy their lives, and let all of that go up in smoke because they're too hard-headed to repent. Jonah had rather be thrown in the overboard and into the sea than repent. Christians have lost their joy. They've lost their peace. They've lost the blessings of God upon their life. They've lost the precious fellowship that they have with the Lord. And, and they've lost the precious desire to fellowship with God's people. And, and they, they'd rather be anywhere than to fellowship with the people that they're supposed to love and worship with and, and serve with and pray for. There's something wrong in your heart. And it's called unforgiveness and bitterness. And it's destroying your life. And it's not only destroying your life, it is destroying all of those in your boat with you. Sin hardens the heart. And so I'll tell you this, before we ever get to the verses, Jonah is not a hero. Jonah is not a martyr. He's a rebel. He has said no to repentance. He has said no to Nineveh. He has said no to God. He said, I'd rather die. I'd rather be thrown overboard in the sea than to repent and do what God asked me to do. God has asked you to love one another. God has asked you to forgive one another. God has asked you to put others before yourself. God has asked you to fellowship with him and commune with him and the things of God. And you're unwilling to repent of your selfishness. You'd rather just be thrown overboard in the sea. Now, look at the verse. We got a lot of verses to be this far along. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know. I was thinking about those three words. He didn't do this in ignorance. I, listen, he said, I know. Do you, do you know throughout the Bible, do you, Jonah knew you know that David knew before he went upon that roof and he should have been at war, he should have been fighting. Did you know that David knew that he should not have been up there? Do you know that David knew he should not be looking at another man's wife? Do you not know that David knew that he had not, should not have sent for another man's wife to come into his presence? You think when Samson laid his head in Delilah's lap that he did not know? Repeatedly, God gave him warning. He, he'd get just a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer to the truth. You know why? Because he knew. And you know what else? You know. And I know what God requires and what God desires. And it's amazing how that we will let pride cause us to be cast into the stormy sea, resulting in the end of our life, than to repent. Look, look at the verse. It goes on. He's not even done yet. And then verse number 12, he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that. Now look, for my sake. For my sake. This has the idea of for my benefit or because of me. And so, here, here listen, are, are you so full of yourself that you'd be willing to put others in harm's way for your benefit? I want to ask that question again. Are you so selfish that you're willing to put others in harm's way for your benefit? If you are, you listen to me carefully. That is not Love. That's far 
from love. And so, it, 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 in fact, it's not love. It's the ultimate act of selfishness and disobedience. I said, he said unto them, what we're still in the verse, take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, sake this, this great, great temptest is, of, is upon you. I mentioned this already, but here is a verse that you can certainly use to prove the point. What we do and the choices we make always affects others. And all of those in the boat with him are affected because of his decision to go away from the presence of the Lord. Now look at verse 13. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Now it's a strange, it's, it's a strange thing how that men always seem to have a better way. Jonah has already told this man that he's the cause of the problem. But instead of them immediately doing something about that, they try themselves. And, I, and I, I'm not condemning them. I don't, I don't blame them. I, listen, I'll get to this in a minute. I, I'm getting ahead of myself, and, and I understand that. And, and I, there's a lot I want to say. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But I don't want to be guilty of throwing anybody in the sea. I don't want to be guilty of harming or taking anyone's life. So I can certainly understand from a contextual situation that these men did not want to throw Jonah overboard. But from a doctrinal position, you cannot save yourself. You, it doesn't matter how hard you row. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how determined you are. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. You cannot row yourself safely to heaven. You have to trust Him who is a substitute for your sin. They're doing everything that they can to get this boat to land. They, they know that this man ha is, is the problem, and they know that, uh, he is the, that he, he's going to have to be cast into the sea. They've already been told in order for them to be saved, and yet they are still doing everything in their power to get this ship to land. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. I mentioned a couple of sermons ago, I talked about in the book of Job, how it talks about skin for skin. And we see that truth being presented here again, how that man will exert every ounce of strength that he has and he'll spend every dollar that he has to try to get a handle or try to get his hands on anything that he who thinks will, will, that it would take to preserve his life for one more minute. And so these men are not willing to throw him overboard. Instead, they want to try to work their way. They want to try. You know, Jonah has already proved to them that you can't do things your way. You'll find yourself in the ship. They're in the ship and instead of doing what the prophet has instructed them to do, no, nope, we're going to do it our way. Hell is full of people and the lake of fire throughout all eternity will be full of people who thought they could do it their way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible says in the book of Acts, Luke said, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. And men all over the world, they're rowing their boat as hard as they can. And they're being as religious as they possibly can think about. And they're trying to do everything that's pleasing to God. And he said, Stop rowing and put your faith in me. Verse says, verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. Now look, don't miss this, but they could not. This little phrase, but they could not, sums up every attempt of man to save himself. I've already said this, I'll say it again. They can't row hard enough. They can't row strong enough. They can't outride the storm. They can't defeat the wind. They can't overcome God's will, and they can't defeat this problem of death, and neither can you. You'll have to trust the Lord. But they could not. Here the Bible says, I'll just read it to you. I'm not going to ask you to turn. 
Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 8, the Bible said, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Every, every man, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, uh, 27, every man has an appointment with death, and it's one that you're going to keep. Regardless of how hard you can row, it's an appointment you're going to keep. Regardless of how much you can spend or who you can go to or whatever the case may be, it's, a, it's, it's something that we cannot overcome. If the Lord doesn't come soon, one of these days you're going to dig a hole out here in the yard and they're going to lower my body down to it. And somebody will probably stick up a monument that's got my name on it. And can I tell you something? It doesn't matter how hard you row. It doesn't matter what doctors you have. It doesn't matter how good your uh, uh, medication is. It doesn't matter how good your insurance is. There's going to come a day that your efforts are going to be insufficient. You better put your faith and your trust in a God who can get your ship to dry land without you drowning in the sea of sin. My heart was broken this morning. I got to talk, thinking about that sea that Jonah was going to be cast into. And I got to thinking about all of those people who are going to be cast into the lake of fire that burned, the, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone because of their refusal to do what thus saith the Lord and turn into him for salvation. Now look, look, at, look at the verse again, verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. This is again a good illustration of man's attempts to save himself by good works or by his own efforts. The, the mariners were unsuccessful. And the reason that they were unsuccessful is because they were fighting against God and or God was fighting against them. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 39. The Bible says, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest haply you be found even to fight against God. You, you can't fight against God. I can't fight against God. The Bible says that the sea was tempestuous against them. So Jonah in his wickedness has brought others into his trouble. Men often say or men frequently say... I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. The only problem with that is that sin always hurts more than the sinner. The alcoholic never hurts just himself. He hurts all of those around him. The drug addict never hurts just himself. They hurt all of those around them. The murderer never hurts just himself. He hurts the entire family of those who he's murdered and also his own family who has to live knowing that there's a murder in his family. We, we can see those things and, and that grieves our heart and yet we do not understand that the Bible and the Lord is just as much against bitterness and anger and wrath and sedition and variance as he is against murder. And drunkenness. But it ain't hurting nobody but me. No. It's hurting everybody around you. I look at verse 14. Wherefore they, this is the mariners now, cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they cry unto the Lord. Like, listen, like so many others. They never cry unto the Lord until they've exhausted all other means. When trouble comes your way, don't use the Lord as a last ditch effort. Run to him at the beginning of of trouble. In fact, run to him before trouble ever comes. Run to him before the problems ever occur. 
these men at the, are at the end of the rope, so they decide it's a good time to cry out to God. They, they've tried everything in their, in their power to avoid casting Jonah into the raging sea, but it is now evident that there's not going to be any way for them to overcome the wind. There's, there's no, going to be no way for them to overcome the rain. There's, there's no way they're going to be over, to able to overcome these tempestuous waves of this storm if they don't cast him into the sea, and now they're concerned about being guilty of murder. What a position to be in. If I stay in this boat, I'm going to die with this man. And this man is so selfish that he won't jump overboard himself. And so I am going to have to throw him in the sea at the peril of my own soul for committing murder. Listen, listen to me. You have no idea what position you're putting those in around you because of your willingness to be disobedient to God. You're putting them in some kind of position that they do not ever deserve to be in. So these men have come to the place in their life, they ask God in this verse of Scripture, they ask God not to hold them guilty for killing a man in order to save themselves. In fact, they say, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. Now, you and I, we have no way of knowing whether or not the court of law would, uh, would exempt these men from murder uh, by claiming self-defense. But either way, I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't ever want to bring harm to someone's life. I, I, I don't care how guilty Jonah is, and there's nobody in here that hates water and boats and especially storms any more than I do. But I want to tell you something. There's just not something within me that wants to take another man's life. And yet here they are, and they're dying. This storm is going to kill them, and it's going to kill Jonah as well. And they say, God, if we throw this man overboard, will you not hold it against us? Can you not see how selfish Jonah is in this act? And yet you fail to see how selfish you are in your act? For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. The Bible says at the end of verse 14, the understanding that these mariners have of God is remarkable. It's been said that there are no atheists among seafaring men. I don't know if that's true or not. It's just a saying. But I know that these men, at the beginning of this chapter, were praying to their God, but now they're asking Jonah's God to have mercy upon them. So there are several things, several things about this. I want you to notice three things about these mariners, three things that these mariners know about God. First of all, in verse number 10, they knew that to disobey God would be an act of defiance that would bring certain doom. The second thing that they knew is they knew that to destroy an innocent man would be wrong in the eyes of God. And the third thing that they knew from verse number 15 is that they were aware that any effort on their part would not undo or override the will of God. Can I tell you something? If you're fighting against God, you're fighting a losing battle. Verse number 15 says, and look at it, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it does to you, but it breaks my heart. So they took up Jonah, and they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So here these men are. They're put in a position that they didn't ask to be in. And they're in that position because of a man who was willing to flee the presence of God and do his own thing. And so now they have a choice to make. In order to preserve my own life, I'm going to have to take this man I don't really even know. And I'm going to have to be a part of picking him up and casting him to his certain death into that sea so that I might live. God help us 
not to put ourselves in that position. And God help us to realize that when we put ourselves in that position, we're putting others in that position as well. There's a constant, if there's a constant raging battle in your life, there may be some things that you need to throw into the sea. Maybe there's some pride or bitterness or anger. Maybe some resentment or unforgiveness. Maybe some vengeance. These things not only destroy your life, they're destroying others around you. Maybe what you need to do this morning, while our hearts are broken for what these men had to do to Jonah, Maybe you'd be willing to reach in your own boat and get pride by the neck, <laughs> cast him overboard. Maybe you'd be willing to get unforgiveness up out of its bed of ease and kick him over the side. Maybe you'd be willing to get rid of that resentment and, and, and bitterness that's in your life and say, God, it just ain't worth it. The boat is going down and I'm going down with the boat where I can just kick it out of my life. As soon as Jonah hit the water, the Bible said the sea ceased its raging. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do you have peace in your life? If there's no peace in your life, there's probably something you need to throw overboard. Because God wants your sea to be calm. He wants your boat ride to be a lot better than it is now. But it's up to you. For the piano player to come this morning, I'll just stop. I'm not finished. Heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment this morning. If God has spoke to your heart, would you come? The Lord wants to help you. Oh, he wants to help you. People all over the building are moving this way. Would you come today? Lord, I need help. It's not just me that's suffering. It's all of those around me. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. I know a man who can save you. And I'd like nothing better than to introduce you to Jesus today.